Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Sporadic E. In this short presentation, we'll provide an overview of sporadic E, an uncommon type of ionospheric propagation that primarily affects signals at VHF frequencies. As you may already know, the ionosphere, a layer of charged particles surrounding the Earth, consists of several layers. One of these layers, the F layer, can refract or bend signals at HF frequencies back towards the Earth, enabling very long distance communications under the proper conditions. This is often called skywave propagation. However, at VHF and higher frequencies, signals reaching the ionosphere are generally not refracted back to Earth and simply pass through the ionosphere and into space. Below the F layer, there's another layer of the ionosphere called the E layer, but under normal circumstances, the E layer is not capable of refracting either HF or VHF signals back towards the Earth. However, under special circumstances, patches or regions of increased ionization in the E layer can refract signals at lower VHF frequencies, thus enabling limited skywave propagation over longer distances. Sporadic E, sometimes also called E-skip or ES, refers to propagation by means of these highly ionized regions, or clouds, in the E layer of the ionosphere. This phenomenon takes place at altitudes of about 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface, and can last for minutes or even up to an hour or more. The signals propagated by sporadic E often have very low path loss, and therefore lead to high received signal strengths at the receiver. Sporadic E can also propagate signals for long distances, typically in the range of 700 to 2500 kilometers. Because of the lower altitude of the E layer, these distances are somewhat lower than the distances achievable with F layer propagation of HF signals. This mode of propagation is called sporadic because it's difficult to predict, but it's still common enough to cause problems. For example, European TV broadcasters and American FM radio broadcasters moved up from their original lower frequencies in part to avoid issues caused by sporadic E. Unlike F-layer propagation, which is usable across most of HF at different times of the day or different days of the year, sporadic E is only usable at higher HF frequencies and lower VHF frequencies. It's most commonly seen around 50 MHz, and on rare occasions it may extend above 150 MHz. Another way of thinking about sporadic E is that it increases the maximum usable frequency, or MUF. This is the highest frequency that can be used for skywave propagation, and is usually no higher than 30 MHz. The dimensions of these clouds of increased E-layer ionization are difficult to measure. They usually are tens of meters to a few hundred meters thick, and from several hundred meters up to two kilometers wide. It's important to remember that sporadic E is a local or regional phenomenon. That is, it only affects propagation over certain geographical regions. We'll talk more about this on the next slide. This is different from standard F-layer propagation at HF frequencies, which tends to be more uniform over hemisphere-sized regions. We can map the location and dimensions of sporadic E clouds by looking at reception reports between pairs of stations. If we draw lines between transmitters and receivers, the intersection of these reports will often show the rough size and center position of the cloud. Sporadic E clouds are, however, not stationary and tend to move slowly over the course of their appearance. In the northern hemisphere, this motion is generally north to northwest and is caused by both winds in the upper atmosphere as well as the Earth's rotation. We've discussed sporadic E in some detail, but have yet to talk about what causes sporadic E. There are, in fact, many different theories about the origins of sporadic E, and as yet there is still no definitive, universally accepted cause. One of the more popular theories is that wind shear, or other types of violent weather, create thin layers of E-layer ionization. Experiments have shown that sporadic E clouds contain high concentrations of metallic ions. However, the lack of a clear, measurable cause makes sporadic E difficult to predict. It's known that peaks in sporadic E activity occur between May and August in the Northern Hemisphere, 
with some smaller peaks in December and January. And while there are studies that suggest that sporadic E may somehow be linked to meteor activity or solar activity, there is still no conclusive correlation between these and the appearance of sporadic E. Before we end this presentation, we need to briefly mention another way that VHF signals may be propagated over long distances. Sharp changes in the troposphere's refractive index can cause ducts that propagate VHF signals, and this is therefore referred to as tropospheric ducting. Although they work in different ways, both tropospheric ducting and sporadic E can produce strong signals over large geographic areas, so it's helpful to understand how to differentiate between them. As we saw earlier, sporadic E clouds can connect many different locations, whereas in ducting, signals usually only propagate between endpoints or sometimes along the path between them. Sporadic E tends to appear and disappear rather suddenly, but tropospheric ducting normally builds up and fades out more slowly, and thus also tends to last longer than sporadic E clouds. Let's end with a brief summary. The ionosphere does not normally support skywave propagation at VHF frequencies in the same way that is commonly seen with lower frequency HF signals. Sporadic E refers to VHF skywave propagation that's enabled by clouds of highly ionized particles in the E layer of the ionosphere. Generally speaking, sporadic E is only seen at frequencies from about 50 to 150 megahertz, and achievable distances using sporadic E are on the order of 700 to 2500 kilometers. The size and location of sporadic E clouds can be approximately mapped by plotting lines connecting transmitters and receivers, and then looking at their intersection. The cause or causes of sporadic E are still not completely understood, making sporadic E difficult to predict. And finally, both sporadic E and tropospheric ducting can propagate VHF signals over longer distances, but these phenomena can be differentiated in a number of different ways. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Sporadic E. If you'd like to learn more about other propagation modes or about rhodian short solutions for radio communications, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.